Okay, let's try it. There we go. I don't have it. I don't know if maybe making you a co-host took that away from me, but hopefully you can still share and everything. I can share. Yeah. You want to try just in case? I do actually. <laughs> All right. You guys can nice. see that? Perfect. I'll just leave this up. Yeah. Okay. I can't see who's coming in. I did see some people were coming in. So welcome to those who have come in already. Um, we'll get going in a few minutes. We just want to let folks come in. Let's find out where everyone's from. Yeah. If you want to drop in the chat where you're joining us from, we'd love to see. Um, where are you guys, our panelists? <laughs> Daniel, we're, Daniel and, and, and Jim are in the same location, almost exactly, right? <laughs> Half a city block. Yeah. Sorry to all those Heat fans. I know that was a, a tough loss. Um, uh -huh. So if you're in Florida, it's probably not the greatest week for you, but at least they made it there, right? They uh, they overcame my Celtics, so nothing much you can say there. <laughs> yeah, I know. We were feeling it a couple of weeks ago, so. Right. See some Pennsylvania. I'm seeing some Florida. All right, a lot of East Coasters. Nice. I think we're all East Coast, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And we're going to start like pretty soon here. I love to reward folks that are on time. Uh, those folks that are straggling in uh, can certainly watch the recording if you missed this. But at 101, we will be beginning. So um, thank you, everyone, for again joining. We're going to try to make this extremely impactful. Uh, this is not a technical webinar, so if you're looking to get three layers deep into Azure, probably not the webinar for you. Um, we're going to talk about sales, prospecting, um, all things sales related. We're going to try to keep it fun, interactive. You guys can use the chat. I'll, I'll have Michelle sort of tee things up here, but um, we just want to keep it fun and pretty light. Got to have fun. Absolutely. All right, Michelle, why don't you kick us off? All right. Welcome, everyone. We're glad to have you here. Um, we're going to start with some team introductions, and then we will move on to talking about some common pain points that MSPs feel in trying to prospect. Um, after that, let's see, we're going to talk about uh, common objections you might hear, things you probably hear a lot from clients. So we'll talk about how to navigate those conversations. Then we'll get into SaaS security reporting and how you can help um, really sell your services with that. Daniel's going to walk us through that. And then we'll have, uh, we have a special guest, Bob Mitchie, who is a fellow MSP with Metro MSP. And I've got some fun facts about him to share. Um, and if you stay to the end, you'll get a, a sales toolkit that you can use to help with your prospecting. So make sure you stick around to the end for that. Um, and just a couple of housekeeping items as we get going. You can ask questions throughout the webinar. We have live Q&A going, so you don't have to save those till the end. Um, this webinar will be recorded, so we can get you a copy afterwards. Um, and immediately following the webinar, we're going to stay on. We'll shut off recording, and you can we'll do a live demo, and you can just kind of dig in a little deeper and ask questions. Um, so stick around if you'd like to after this, okay? All right, so we're gonna get into it. We'll kick it off by introducing our sales team. Pat Sullivan is our VP of sales. Pat, would you like to introduce the rest of the team? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Michelle. And yeah, definitely stick around to the end. Those that stick around will get that QR code with the playbook, with the SASE report, with the go-to-market strategy deck. So it's a little incentive to, to keep you on here. And this hour will go very quickly. So, um, we're going to try to uh, add nothing but value here to your sales funnel and go to market. Uh, so myself, Pat Sullivan, VP of sales uh, with me is my go to market team, Jim MacGyver and Daniel Sapp. They're both regional sales managers. Next slide. Their territories are outlined here in this slide. So you can clearly see who it is. Uh, so if you're not a current customer yet and you do want a product demo or you want uh, information about the product, look up your territory here. Uh, Daniel does cover all of international. Jim has uh, Canada, our friends to the north. Uh, we actually have a nice, strong uh, Canadian base. So thank you uh, very much for those uh, Canadian MSPs out there. Um, 
So you can see their territories there included and their email addresses. You can go ahead and put a one in the chat if you want one of them to reach out to you directly or be proactive. Otherwise, uh, you can feel free to get with them on, um, on your own time. Next slide. I do want to introduce our account management team. If you haven't met um, these um, lovely resources, they are really good at what they do, best in class, dare I say. And uh, if you are an, incurrent, um, an incumbent partner or an existing SAS Alerts partner, and you do not know who your account manager is, if you've never interacted with them, please put a zero into the chat. And by hitting zero, that will trigger Dana, Connor, or uh, Alex to reach out to you, introduce themselves. Uh, they can really help with uh, sales enablement, uh, go to market, well, more of the um, how to get this across to your base, uh, all of the other how-to questions that you might have. So wonderful group here to help. Next slide. I want to talk uh, a little bit about setting the table and setting the right expectations. And that um, setting the right expectations goes true not only for business, but personal as well. Um, whenever you set the right expectations, you usually have a pretty good outcome. And I want to make sure we're all clear on the division of responsibility. You can clearly see here on the infograph to the left, and this is right from Microsoft's website, that they are clearly not responsible for the SaaS component around security. Um, you know, accounts and identities, devices, information and data, that is all up to you as the customer. And if you're managing uh, the customer's Office 365 or M365 environment, you can definitely bet that you're going to be, be held liable if there's a problem. And to go one step further, right, the big takeaway here is Microsoft has absolved all, all responsibility. And if you read those last two uh, sentences there, it really does drive the point home, the fact that Microsoft will not be held liable. And actually, you will be held liable if there is a breach or a security incident. Um, and look, you're living in a fantasy world if you don't think that when it comes time, if a, if a customer, small especially small business owner, if they lose their data, or if they have a breach or a ransomware attack, you bet they're going to go after the provider that is managing that environment. And going back to the setting the right expectations, they assume you're protecting all this stuff anyways. They have made all these changes as far as where they work, how they work. Right, typically, and especially with COVID, they don't go into the office as much. Some are pure remote, and they're just assuming, unless you tell them otherwise, they're assuming that you've got all this stuff covered. So it's very important to be proactive with your base um, and making sure that everybody knows <clears throat> what exactly you're covering and what else you have to bolt on as uh, times change. So we want you to be very proactive in your uh, in your approach across the board. So Pat, okay. on, on that same on, on that same topic. Of the, of the security piece here, be of securing the uh, Azure environments, for example, if somebody gets into a client environment and starts spinning up Azure resources, they're responsible. You bet. So that's, that, that's a big dollar number that somebody could ultimately have to pay. Yep, exactly. And it's, you know, as the days go, you, you're finding these bad actors and these sophisticated bad actors finding easier ways in. And it's not so much through the infrastructure anymore. Right, that's the old school attack approach. They go and they attack the infrastructure, the routers, switchers, firewalls, you name it. Now it's all about the identity and making and knowing that one of those users is going to be lazy and they're going to click that phishing link. So they're trying to get in, and we know that a majority are from business email compromise. Yes, Ryan. Sorry, Sorry I said I know I wasn't going to pipe up throughout your entire presentation. <laughs> no, you're fine. But I'm a liar. Um, <laughs> you're good. To Bob's, to Bob's point, we've actually seen that in a, a partner who had a breach before pre SAS alerts, one of the reasons they came to us. Um, where they thought they had remediated, remediated all of the things that they saw, but that admin account that they lost access to, to, to a failure of an individual in their company, was leveraged to sign into Azure and spin up VMs. So once they had remediated all these things, they kind of forgot about that one bit until they got a bill for $67,000 from Microsoft for the added resources that they had been leveraging to attack other people. Um, and there was, there was no recourse to say that wasn't me. It was very clearly spelled out that it was on them. So... It's a real thing, and it should be added to your DR strategy and tabletops if you don't have it there already to double check what your infrastructure as a service looks like after an attack. Excellent point, Ryan, and and feel free to you know, jump in uh, as you see fit here. There's an open forum. All right, let's go next slide. So I want to talk about some of the pain points and common pain points. Um, I actually polled a few business owners that I know about what they're looking for in an IT provider. And one of them was really around 24 hour support. They really wanted to make sure that they had their backs no matter what time of day or night or long weekend, what have you. And the other one was actually just around being in your backyard and being a, a drivable distance. Um, 
you know, one of them joked, I said, well, why do you need them locally? We can do so much remotely. And he joked and said, so I can wring their neck when the internet goes down. And like, we all know, right, it, it being in this realm that you guys don't control the internet, uh, but your customer certainly thinks you do. And so it all goes back to setting the right expectations and them understanding what services you're providing or that you're not providing today. Um, so local is accountable right in your backyard. I like to call it right a 25 mile radius where you can go and target. You are very, very lucky if you're in an office building or you're in a strip mall or a shopping center that has local businesses attached to you. No better way to get in than to offer some sort of group discount or some incentive to get people in your own building uh, under management. You're right there. Uh, it's a great way. And I've seen a lot of partners leverage that, that people that are literally just two doors down or a floor above or a floor, floor below. Um, look, and also, next slide, please. Prospecting into your base. And we'll cover some of these other topics here, but I hear our CEO, Jim Lippy talk about it all the time, uh, about how when you go and prospect for a, if you bought a list or you're trying to get someone to take a meeting, right? How many times, and I would love to hear this in the chat, uh, just as far as numbers go, how many times do you reach out to someone before you stop trying for a cold prospect? And it's probably more than once, right? Five, six, the magic number of seven. How many times are you reaching out to the to that cold prospect you've never done business with? Multiple times. And so why don't you think about that the same way when you target your existing customer base, right? So when you have these meetings with your customers, there's probably a really good chance they don't have all of your products and services. And if you do not keep them apprised of what you're doing and what products and services you do have, you've got to bet that someone else will. And we have seen providers lose business because their customers went elsewhere because they didn't know that they had um, access to that technology. So letting the customers know and your current base know of what you have is oh so important. And again, it's the lowest hanging fruit. You've already got that relationship. They already trust you. So going back to them with some of our sales and marketing materials and saying, guys, the environment has changed. You now work from home. Microsoft is holding me liable for some of these things. I need a better way to keep you protected 24 hours a day, right? So getting into your own client base, it almost sounds like an oxymoron prospecting into my own base, but I got to assume that they're not buying every single product and service um, that you offer. Um, okay, so moving on to verticals. You want to start with a common vertical. And guys, I don't have all the answers here. There's no silver bullet. Uh, hopefully I'm reaffirming things you already know. And if you can take away one or two things from this webinar that you didn't already know, um, you know, re that's really the goal here. So with verticals, might be pretty obvious to think, but you start with a common one, something that you're comfortable with. You know, maybe you have a family member uh, or, you know, a family of attorneys, lucky you or, or not so lucky you, depending on your perspective there. Or maybe you went to college for life sciences or, or have friends or, and family in the medical field. So you might look at, you know, things around HIPAA or, or just medical in general. Uh, maybe your husband or wife is an accountant, you know, so you might target pro services vertical. But something that you're comfortable and familiar with is always a good place to start if you don't have a good starting spot, uh, point. Size, this is a pretty easy one, right? You don't want to be a three-man shop going in and trying to land that thousand person uh, hospital. And if you do, congratulations, I would quickly go out and rehire or, and, and hire some folks to help you manage that. So it should be, it should go without saying, but right-sizing your workload is uh, is certainly the, the best way to achieve your, your goals. Um, don't bite off more than you can chew. That goes right into right-sizing your workload. And then additional resources. Right, I I wouldn't be where I'm at today if it wasn't for leveraging my network. So leveraging your employees, your friends, your professional network on LinkedIn, and the big one here that I think doesn't get a lot of praise, but the cha local chamber of commerce. You know, they have the the heartbeat of the small town or city that you live in, and there's a really good chance that they have access to business owners that you might not know about. You can get on their email list. Heck, and if you're lucky enough, you can do IT for them. So it really goes a long way for chambers of commerce. Um, and also, you know, while we're on that topic, if you're saying, well, I don't have a lot of resources or I'm not really savvy with posting a lot or, or using my network, you know, through LinkedIn or Facebook or, or any of those social media sites, there are really good applications now that you can sign up. Most of them for free or uh, for a small fee that you can sign up for that'll do your posts. So you can load up a bunch of posts and have those go over a period of time. 
So doing these small things that don't cost a lot helps show value. It shows consistency. I mean, heck, there are certain MSPs that I think of all the time in New Hampshire because I'm hearing them on the local uh, you know, news broadcasts. I'm seeing them, I'm seeing them pop up on podcasts. They're uh, advertising on the local ball field, right? So being consistent with your messaging and being out there, especially if you're in a smaller community, really helps gain that trust. And uh, Michelle, I know you have a lot of experience in marketing and with social media. Do you have any uh, applications that are your go-to as far as helping push content out or making that more scalable? Uh, well, you guys internally know I'm a huge HubSpot fan, but for those with uh, smaller budgets, we have um, Hootsuite has been great. That's sort of a standard for social media. Um, there are some Social Bee, I think, um, is tailored towards smaller businesses. It's probably a little more affordable than a Hootsuite or a Agora Pulse. But there are definitely, you know, social media platforms out there where you can schedule, you can post, they will help with content as well. Um, so do your research. There are a number of blog articles that will, will give you a great list. Excellent. Well, thank you, Michelle. We'll go to the next slide and we'll talk, we'll keep talking around these common pain points. And, and one of the questions I get asked is like, well, you know, I see all these other people doing these referral programs, but I don't know how it works. Where do I start? And we actually have a lot of luck doing that with SAS alerts. You know, a lot of our business comes, you know, from trade shows, but it also comes from who else do you know that might need the service? And we have a referral program. I'll ask someone to drop the link in um, for people to access where we'll pay you $500 for the referral, right? It's a one-time payout for us, but hopefully we gain that customer for life. And you can do the same exact thing with your customer base. Refer a law firm that you also know, Mr. Attorney, or you, you know, you must have friends in your professional network outside of lawyers. And lawyers are just my go-to vertical, so um, just bear with me there. Um, so implementing your own referral program can do wonders. And again, it doesn't cost you a lot. Yes, it's an upfront one-time spend, but hopefully you'll get that recurring revenue from them where you'll have that customer for life much longer and a really quick pay, uh, much quicker payback um, for that referral program. So leveraging your base, um, you might even do a free month of services. It doesn't have to be 500 bucks or a payout. It could be other things that might intrigue your customers. Um, organizing customer focused events. Uh, the classic, I think it's a little bit played out, but it actually still works lunch and learns. I don't love breakfast and learn or dinner and learn. It does not roll off the tongue uh, as nicely as lunch and learns. So those are still popular, right? Uh, one of the most outside the box and most creative ones was a, uh, a partner out of the uh, Northeast, and they did this cybersecurity forum. And they actually, it was around the risks that you take as a small business, and they called it whiskey business. And they had, you know, bourbon tasting, or they had flights that you could actually go. Hopefully, the incentive not was not to get them so intoxicated, they would just sign on the dotted line. Uh, but it was a neat way to get people into the group uh, to to give a um, you know a webinar or to give a presentation and have a little fun with it. I think they gave away a, a bottle of bourbon at the end or something. But um, I love that topic, and it just, just it's another outside the box uh, approach. Uh, virtual events, webinars with incentives, right? We're trying to have an incentive for this one. Uh, those virtual events became very popular during COVID. No one could travel. They're very cheap and inexpensive. All you need is a Zoom account there. Um, and even Top Golf, right? Bob, you had mentioned Top Golf. Do you have you done um events with Top Golf? We haven't done anything at Top Golf. Top Golf is um they're breaking ground. They're 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 actually trying to get approval for a Top Golf in town here. I've been to a couple events at Top Golf, which, which are great. Uh the state houses have been really good for events because people get pe people get nervous on running events. It's like, well, what's it really gonna cost me? And um, uh, what we found is places like Ruth's Chris Steakhouse, they'll open up for lunchtime to do an event, and we only pay for the steaks we order. So mm -hmm. we have we we might have a fifteen hundred dollar minimum, but if we don't, if something happens or we can't get people there, that's all we're on the hook for. And at the end of the day, the end of the event, they handed they handed me a bill for the number of steaks because they don't because unlike using a um a a, 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 a wet wedding venue. You know, if, if Bruce Chris doesn't sell sell the steak at lunchtime, they'll sell it at dinner. Yep. Great point. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, and then lastly, you know, building trust in your community. 
um, being active in the community, uh, you know, whether that's donating to a local charity, not only does that help with PR, it makes you feel good, it's the right thing to do, but people also see you as a thought leader there and being community involved. Um, we have, hopefully we have some millennials on this call. Give us a one if you're a millennial, because we know what are the things we know about millennials? Okay, they sleep late. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, they definitely like to work wherever and from where, whenever and however. They're, they don't want to be chained to a desk. We definitely know that. Um, and we know that they want you to have a car. Your millennials and folks that are buying definitely want to see some sort of cause that what is your mission in life outside of uh, just pure profits. They want to know that you actually care, that you have some stake in the community in some sort of passionate thing, whether it be helping veterans, whether it be helping um, you know, childhood cancer, uh, you know, animals, you know, you name it, right? So if you don't have something in place and it's not a lot of money, and again, it's, it's part of just feeling good and, and doing the right thing, but building trust, um, having your name and logo out there uh, is just a really good way. So that way, when you do talk to the client, you do interact with them. It's like, oh yeah, I've seen you in the news or I've seen you in the paper, or I drive by your sign three times a week. Okay. So it just adds credibility. And by the way, too, building trust comes with having a good website. It is not hard to have a good website these days. Um, I built a website on my own for free. It, I mean, it is super easy and I'm not technical at all. And it actually looks pretty good. So not having a good website, being in the tech space, again, very, very obvious, or it should be obvious, but take a look at your own website and ask yourself, put yourself in your customer's shoes. Can I navigate through here? Send someone that doesn't know anything about IT to your website and ask them to give you a quick you know, judgment of, of what it looks like, you know, and if it's confusing. And really at the end of the day, and we've heard this time and time again, if it's easy to tell, it's easy to sell. So if you have a big convoluted website, if you have so many services out there, right, it's going to get pretty convoluted. If you have a nice form page that people can contact you and reach out and you clearly identify your services, that's really going to help drive adoption. Okay, next slide, please. I'm going to go into a common pain point of how do I effectively present my services? How do I pitch this stuff, right? And we'll get into Daniel's demo of the reports module here in just a few minutes, in nine minutes to be exact. The next slide, we'll talk about, you know, at the end of this webinar, you're going to get a QR code and this QR code will cover our pitch deck. So that's a, a vanilla webinar that you can use, a, a, a vanilla PowerPoint that you can use that has stats and, and uh, screenshots of our, um, of our tool. We've got the prospecting playbook, the ultimate prospecting playbook on how to actually gain trust from the customer. And it goes a little bit deeper than some of the high level stuff I'm just talking about with the events. It actually goes through each step. Um, the pricing calculator, how do you price the services? Do you bundle it in? Do you do it as an add-on? You know, how do you actually price this out? Knowing what your cost is, what your low cost is, and how do you actually go to market with this? And then the SASE report, you'll get a SASE report that's once a year, and that covers all of the data that we're collecting as SAS alerts. We anonymize it and put it into a nice, easy to read format that you can then be armed with that information and have a better, more proactive approach to your cybersecurity. And part of what we're seeing is this shift. We're really seeing customers or you know, my customers being you as the MSP, we're seeing the shift from I'm a managed service provider and I manage your data to I'm a cybersecurity expert. I manage your cybersecurity. I keep you safe at night. And here's the package or here's what it's going to cost you to do business with me to make sure because there's a bare bones minimum that I put in here now that we're living in this new world. And this new world is sort of post COVID, the work from anywhere, work from any device. And, you know, it's just, it's one of those things that you have trepidations up front, trying something new, right? Rolling this out to your base. Try it with a handful of customers. Heck, try it with a handful of customers that you're willing to lose. Everybody has three or four handful of customers that you wouldn't really, you'd actually be better off if you lost them. And maybe they've just been a long time customer, but you know that you don't make a lot of money off of them. You know, your, your prices are not where your services are. So if, you have not raised your prices. And if you haven't thought about retooling your bundles, you're not running out of time, but boy, like 
after COVID, there's not a single thing that did not go up in price. What you're paying for uh, butter at the grocery store, what you're paying for you know, this pen, what you're paying for your computer, what you're paying for everything, every service, every product across the board. I, I challenge you to pick one. Give me one thing in the chat if you find it has actually gone, to, gone down. And I might eat my words there, but most of the, the times we're finding everything is going up. So if you haven't raised your prices, people, they don't love paying more, but they're willing to do so because they know it's a sign of the time. And you're just fooling yourself if you don't think your costs have gone up. Run the numbers, understand what your costs are. And again, it's he or she with the most information wins. So you're going to get this whole prospect prospecting playbook, the toolkit after the call using the QR code. Presenting a warm pitch at events. So this is where I start getting into you need a good salesperson. Most of you probably have a sales team, right? And if you are just the only person on your sales team, you might really want to rethink that. And I know it's a little scary, like, okay, I got to go out and hire a salesperson. But I can't tell you how many vendors I've seen. It shows that, hey, they're the CEO, they're the, the main guy. Right, but they might not be the best salesperson. So although they are the end all be all, whether it's lacking the personality, social skills, whatever, everyone has a right role. I understand if you're just starting out, sometimes you have to play multiple roles. But getting somebody that is passionate about sales, that understands your product, that believes your vision and that shares your vision really, really helps and allows you to work on your business, not in it, allows you to be an escalation point. Right. And let's get into we don't have to get into every dollar and, and, and nickel and dime here, but you got to pay the salesperson well. Michelle's favorite line in the history of lines, if you pay peanuts, you'll get monkeys. Good. Right? Good one. She just loves it. She's giddy. Love it. And, and I say that because, I mean, I've been in sales my whole life. I'm doing just fine. And there's, a, there's definitely that line between commission, base salary, and you have to keep the salespeople incented. They have to like working for you, right? There's got to be some culture there. But I will say this, that sales cures all sins. You could even have a terrible culture and you could have someone come in and land two big deals that changes the game. And you'll be shocked at how quickly that resonates and goes through, goes through um, your organization. So getting somebody that shares your vision, that's passionate, that's hungry, that's going to show up every day uh, is so important to helping really scale and getting this program off the ground for you. Um, and then let's talk cyber assessments and I'll ask Bob about free versus paid. And that seems to be uh, a hot topic these days. And I would love to get, uh, people's opinions here. You could either write free or paid or none if you don't do any, but please in the chat, let us know. I'm just, it's more curiosity here. Do you do free assessments for prospects? Do you do paid or do you not do them at all? And we'll collect all these results and, and we'll talk about this on our next webinar. And by the way, this is, I think, a good time to bring up too. And sorry, I'm asking you to do so much participation here, but we want to keep this webinar series going and we will, we'll stop it if we get, you know, zero to, to no feedback, or if we get negative feedback, you say you hated it, we'll stop it. Right. But hopefully this is adding enough value where you say, I want to learn more. I want to know more about these different things that you're talking about in the toolkit. So. For our next webinar series, we will pick one of these things in the prospecting toolkit to deep dive. We'll go from front to from uh, you know beginning to end. So, do you guys want to see guys and gals? Do you want to see us present a mock demo of the pitch deck of the PowerPoint? Would you rather the next webinar be around that prospecting playbook and actually us walking through that playbook and how to get to the yes? Do you want us to cover the the pricing calculator? and talk about ways to actually price and bundle this service? Or would you rather us spend time on the SASE report to show you the different trends of what's happening and where those attacks are coming from? We'd love your feedback. I know which one I'd rather present, but this is not all about me. This is about you. So let us know what you're passionate about or what you want to see more of, and we'll definitely tee that up for the next webinar. All right, so we've gone through all of those things. Let's with the, my next, I've got two minutes left. I'm gonna cover two more quick slides and then we'll turn it over to Daniel and he'll bring you through the reporting engine. So overcoming common objections, right? These are most some of the most commonly asked questions. I don't have it in my budget, Mr. MSP, or they call you IT guy, right? Our end users don't really know MSP, they know IT. So I don't have it in my budget. 
A great question for you to ask them, could you afford to lose business for several days due to a breach? Or a better way of asking it, how long could you afford your business to be down? Powerful question because until they've actually asked themselves that, sometimes they don't know. And hopefully, you know, the answer is going to be, well, I couldn't live, you know, 10 minutes without my data. Or maybe I could go a day, but not much longer. Right. And that's the problem with not having the proper coverage. And look, use your local media, use local um anything that's in the news these days, local or national. I mean, it's out there and your customers are buying security. We're seeing from the SaaS alert side other vendors quickly trying to catch up with us and turning into, hey, we also do cybersecurity because that's what sells. That's the hot topic right now. And for good reason, because those bad actors have gotten so sophisticated. MFA is not the end all be all these days, right? And we can get into all those examples. I see, Bob, you're shaking your head, right? It's back in 2016, 17. Hey, Emma, you both on MFA, you're good. Now there's token hijacking. There's all these different methods of them getting in. And especially with those phishing campaigns. And Bob, you're from pretty familiar with those phishing campaigns and a little teaser there. So, yeah, I've played with them before. Yeah. So my nephew does it for me. We get that sometimes. Hey, I've got a family member. My uncle, cousin, nephew does IT. You know, we don't need you. Well, great. We can actually make them, him or her, part of the solution. Right? With role-based access control, you can make them or have them receive the alerts. You can make them look like the hero. They can set up automated rules and shut down the bad actors in the middle of the night and get more of their time back. They don't have to be that threat hunter looking for things, losing sleep. They can scale with SAS alerts. Uh, I don't know my GA or I don't know how to get those GA creds. Sometimes that can be the scariest thing. Mr. Customer, I need those keys to the castle. Well, good news for you. SAS alerts makes it really easy to get those. And most of the time, you don't even have to get those from the customer. You can provide them with a secure link. And so when you provide them with the email link, they can go and fill out the form and then have you run the reports that Daniel's about to show you. So that should never be an objection is like, hey, I'm not giving it. I don't know you from Adam. Or maybe I've seen your logo once or twice, but that means nothing. I, like, this is a big ask of you. Well, great. You don't even have to give it to me. You can fill out this link. We'll wipe it after 20, you know, after uh, a few weeks. And we'll bring the report back and we'll show you the good and the bad and the ugly. Okay. So, 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 so Pat, the uh, GA creds, uh, question is actually a really good wedge question against the existing the existing IT provider that might be in there you know because yeah. you, you can always use it around hey if you don't have this your IT provider can attention potentially hold your data hostage you need to have this as your data exactly and Bob we hear that too right they'll say I don't even have it oh my IT guy has it. Even MSP know. a has lot of people it. don't know it exists right 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 so getting that and keeping your oops I'm getting some feedback here if someone could go off mute um uh, Make, keeping your current MSP honest or at least poking some of the holes or planning that FUD, right? And showing what they might not be giving you. And SAS certs can really help uncover uh, a lot of that stuff. And I know I'm running out of time here. So I'm going to cruise through these last couple. I don't ever get attacked. I don't need security. That's nonsense. Our reports will show you exactly where the attacks are coming from. And if they say, I don't have millions of dollars, I have a small bank account. Well, great. You're, you're prime for the pick in here because these bad actors and all these guys, they don't even have to be foreign. They could be people in your own organization. They could be down the road. They know that small businesses are probably skimping out on IT. And so they want to get a lot of small wins, $10,000 here, $15,000 there. They know that these larger enterprise companies or at least they think they know that they're spending a lot on IT. And we know that that's not really the case either, but it's the perception. So, okay, last slide. And I promise, Daniel, you're going to have the floor. Uh, these are some great questions to ask your prospects. Do you have an IT service provider today? If not, jump all over it. You know, you've pretty much got that deal if you position it right. Is your current MSP or IT provider proactive or reactive, right? Are you constantly telling them about things? My, my favorite one is talk to me about SLAs, if they even know what that is. If you have a problem at two in the morning, do you know who to contact and when? How do you know, you know, how long is it going to take to fix the problem? Like all these different, do you know what you're paying for? Is it is it clear? So. Getting into the customer, asking the right questions is always key, and you can never ask um, too many questions. It's just knowledge is power. He or she with most information wins. I can't say that enough. Okay, my time is up. We're going to toss it over to Daniel. 
Daniel, you, he'll go through all the different uh, reports and risk reports and all the things that you can run to make you more dangerous out there. And then we'll turn it over to Bob. We'll do a nice fireside chat with Mr. Mitchie. Daniel, take it away. Awesome. Thank you. And I, I do have to say, I think the biggest surprise so far is when you asked for the millennials in the chat, Bob, I didn't see you type the one. We go way back. So <laughs> not too sure that. Uh, the first thing I want to bring up, you know, we're here to talk about prospecting, right? The things that are helping you land clients consistently. And our reports module is a really, really big piece of that that a lot of our folks are utilizing. The biggest thing from the get-go, if you notice, you can white label it. It's going straight from you and not from us. We don't want we don't want you to have to go to your folks and they you're selling SaaS alerts to them. You're selling your services and even more services you're doing for them consistently. You can go in and schedule all these reports too. So keeping yourself top of mind for your customer, especially with everyone being remote for potential and current customers is more key than it's ever been because everyone's working remote. No one's in the office anymore. You're not seeing them every day. So being able to do it from a new sales and current sales perspective is more relevant than ever. It's super simple too. You can do it anywhere from a daily to a yearly basis and consistently utilize these reports. Our risk report to start off, this is a prospecting webinar. It's okay, when I do get those GA creds and I'm in that environment, what type of information am I actually pulling out of there? Well, right from the get-go, what we're gonna give you is the map itself. Super easy to access, but if you'll notice, actually, if you click on any of the alerts here, notice how simple it is. One of the problems that a lot of our MSPs are encountering is that they go in and they have these meetings with potential customers or even their current customer base, and they're getting too technical and you're losing the customer and you're losing their interest. Being able to show quick, easy hits of what you're able to add value to and why your security tools are so relevant is becoming more important than ever. And this is a really easy way to start off. It doesn't take a computer science major to see, I've got a bunch of hits that are coming out of a separate country. And that helps add more value to what you're gonna to bring to the table or for what you're already bringing to the table. Uh, Jim, I think you have a couple of questions for me. So let's start off with the first one here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I show this report, a common question that I get from a lot of MSPs interested is, do I need to put this on everybody? Or uh, how do I decide which customer should I run a risk report on? Great question. And to answer that question, I literally have the shirt on. Put that shit on everyone. And the reason why we say it like that is because you want to make sure that you put it on potential clients, current clients, and even co-managed clients, believe it or not. I know that's a scary thought for a lot of MSPs, but let me explain it to y'all. For potential new clients, you're going to be able to show them the malicious activity in their environment here. This is, you know, if they have an MSP they're working with. It's like, hey, do you know this is going on? Bob was talking about it, hijacking their data or hijacking their credentials. It's like, hey, do you know all this malicious activity is going on? Or are you just paying a blind check every single month? It helps create that doubt inside of their minds already. Those current customers, you want to upsell them on different solutions. Let's say you've got someone that's showing up on the map up here with consistent authentication failures out of China, India, anything like that, you'll be able to be like, hey, this is why we need something with password rotation involved. Being able to consistently upsell your other tools. The last part, and this is the really interesting part, Pat talked about it, we have something called role-based access control. We will give you the ability to actually give access to the environment to someone who has an internal IT team so they can see their own data and what's going on. The reason why it's making that conversation a lot easier is because now those internal IT teams are not worried about you going in and taking their job. You're giving them the tools to make them look like a hero. And you're making that type of process way easier than it used to be, especially now because we're seeing, and I, I believe the last time I looked at the statistic, an increase of 30% in co-managed environments. So it's starting to rise up a lot more. Going into the file share events here, this is really big too, because as you're going into those potential new customers, if you've got a doctor's office, for example, they need to be HIPAA compliant. Having files shared out externally without expirations is a recipe for disaster. So we wanna make sure that we can present the level of visibility we're going to have for those customers, especially as you continue to through your sales process with them. There's a couple other ones that go into it as well in regards to new sales, but for your current customers too, being able to consistently show them. Everyone on this call knows how easy it is to share a file in Google or Microsoft. So being able to show it to them and remind them of the security practices you need in place and also taking care of them and adding the extra value to it is really what's going to help you not just prospect into potential customers, but also into your current base as well. Uh, Jim, I think that you have another question following up after this, correct? 
Right. Yeah, actually, I want to hit the one that's in the Q&A real quick. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, Gary asked if uh, he said we have recently deployed SaaS alerts for all of our clients. How are we going to implement SaaS alerts for prospects and not pay for them? Uh, simply put, the way that the product is designed is so that you can put these things on in the middle of a month. So you know when your bill date is. Typically, it's at the end of the month. Uh, we don't bill at the high water mark for the month specifically for this reason. What we do is we actually provide you guys that time in the middle between your last bill date and your next bill date where you can add anyone you'd like, pull the reports, get all the information you need to build out that, that review, and then go ahead and next to their organization tab, you'll see a little pencil icon where you can go in and remove the, um, the connection to their M365 tenant or wherever whatever it is you're testing, and we'll stop. We won't bill for it. You'll be able to keep the logs for up to a year, um, but you'll be able to go back to them with the information that you gleaned and present this to them as something that they, should be, they would benefit from. Um, and if they say yes, then you go ahead and add them back and you bill a monthly after that but you get 28 days out of every month in between your build dates that you can add customers, prospect, keep them on if they say yes, in the very rare scenario, which in our experience is less than 6% of the time, they say no, make sure they sign something to protect you because when they do get breached, you don't wanna be responsible and pull them off. It's not a big deal. I hope that answered the question, Gary. And Gary actually stole the question that Jim had. It was the same exact one, which is basically what's the cost behind it. And to Ryan's point, Unlimited prospecting, it's as easy as going in here and deleting the user out. So you have the ability to consistently utilize these reports for your potential new customers without having to worry about, you know, paying for the high watermark, which is a really big advantage of using SaaS alerts. Um, jumping into basically, you know, you're talking to the potential customer, they have the malicious activity going on. Then you run the MFA settings report for them as well. The reason these two work well in conjunction is because if they're working with another service provider, it's like, hey, do you know that all this is going on? And then on top of that, you guys have your MFA turned off. This is really, really key for planting that seed of doubt into those customers and really starting to expand your services. In. Alternatively, if you want to schedule it to current clients as well to keep security top of mind, we definitely recommend it. You get the ability to do it for Google also, so it's not just for the Microsoft side of the house. But this really helps in that new sales process to plant that seed of doubt of, you know, maybe, and literally how Bob was saying before, maybe that they don't know exactly what's going on with their current service provider and they're able to start working with you. Jumping into the uh, proceeding reports, the cyber assessment report here, we see works successfully in prospecting a lot in potential customers, but I actually like it a lot for current customers more so. And here's the reason why. You've got here your logged events to critical alerts. This is showing the job you're doing of mitigating the risk in their environment. If you have a customer you're working with, and they've been pushing back on a password manager or an MFA solutions, hey, how do we get this ratio down? I'm glad you asked. That's why we want to implement these solutions. Being able to use SaaS alerts, not just to sell SaaS alerts alone, but your other solutions is what my most successful partners are doing right now. So we're big on the map functionality, as you can tell. As you keep scrolling down through here, this incident breakdown is going to tether more to their environment the longer it's in it. That being said, if you have certain messaging you want to get across, we give you the ability to customize it too when you're talking to them. This is the really neat part because now as you start to really dig through the cyber assessment report, you're able to highlight the users and individuals that are coming up the most for them. For potential customers, it's really good because they might not be sure about their employee base. For current customers, folks they may already be worried about. Because as you'll see here for failed logins, you've got all the tally of those there, the amount of alerts those users are generating as well, so we're able to see who are the users that are creating the most alarming activity. As you keep going down, the login activity is here. The unapproved logins, we hope you never see this, but you definitely need the reporting behind if it, if it does happen, which is gonna show you where they've logged, who's logged in from unapproved locations. As you keep going down, the final part here, the externally, uh, external file share events. We showed you in the other report, it's for the whole company. Let's dig a little bit deeper. Let's see the users who are sharing out the most files the users who are doing things they're not supposed to. This really helps you dive in. And when you go to prospect at your current customer base, you're raising your credibility as their service provider from all the visibility you're giving them and what you can do, uh, what goes behind it as well. Um, Jim, I think that you've got another question, after, uh, another question for me, correct? Right, yeah, in this context, we spoke about this before, I often get the same question, how, how long do I need to run these reports before I can really show this to a client, have a meaningful engagement? Do I need 30 days? Do I need, uh, well, what's the optimal amount of time that gives me enough data to have a good conversation that could lead to a positive engagement? Great question. I tell people I think it's a week. And the reason why I think it's a week is because how many times do you see attacks happen during the week? Significantly less than on the weekend. That's when you have the uptick in activity, 
You're going to have a bunch of different things going on and being able to show those customers, hey, this is what went on on the weekend. But here's the cool part. And the folks who have utilized Respond with SaaS Alerts know this, with the auto remediation, when they go in on Monday and they get that report that shows there was a malicious activity, they're going to see how quickly you took care of it too. So that's going to add an extra peace of mind for them. So especially, let's say you've got, I've talked to a couple of folks that the only thing they're doing for their customers right now are firewalls. You start running this for them. You tell them, hey, let me take care of your Microsoft tenant and show you what we can do. All of a sudden, they had a business email compromise that you were able to immediately kick the bad actor out and you have the proof right in front of you. The tool literally sells itself to them. So that's why I think it's a good idea. At least give it a week because you really want to start gathering that information because knowledge is power. Wow. And then, Jim, I think you have one last question for me as well. Right, yeah. And the last one, a follow-up to that was definitely, what would you say the best report is to, to, to really upsell to current customers? The one that really grabs their attention. That's the account detail report. This is my personal favorite. This works in every aspect of your business, whether it's prospecting potential customers to your current base, to even just doing it to show your value to your customer who's under everything. And here's why. This works really well for two types of employees the new employee and the suspicious employee. And as you dive down into it here, you've got all the DLP events here. If they have a suspicious employee who they think is looking for another job, who just gave their two weeks and might be going somewhere else, what better way to see what's going on than all the files and data that they're messing with here? So you'll get all the DLP events here. For that new employee, that's more on the human error side. It could just be someone that's not too familiar with company policies. Having some light on that, being able to see what's going on for those users is especially critical too. As you go down into the identity and access management events, this is going to show you if there's failed logins where they're coming from, or you just hired someone. I'm down in Miami. Am I actually working from where I say I am? You can consistently check that. And the last part of this is that I've seen actually MSP start to do this more. They'll charge their customers and use this as a productivity check for their users because everybody's working remote now. Are they actually signing in from where they're supposed to? Are they actually doing the things they're supposed to in the environment? So you'll get the full summary of that here. And then at the bottom here for these policy and compliance events, this is what's gonna tie into that weekend of collecting data, right? Let's say that you've responded to a business email compromise and blocked off an email forwarding rule. It's gonna show up within the policy and compliance events. You'll know that someone tried to enable it. And you'll also have the record in there to show your customer that you handled it. So we see that work really well. The last part, I tell all of our folks, these critical medium and low alerts here, everybody works with different compliances. HIPAA needs five years worth of data retention. CMMC needs 24 seven monitoring. You can schedule these out to yourselves on a quarterly or yearly basis. If you need to present it to someone, it's easy to access. You're not siphoning through 6,000 logs on your PSA. Your customers and your auditors will probably thank you for it. So appreciate the, the time on all that. And I believe it's over to Bob now. That was perfect, Dan. I was like right on time. Great job. <laughs> Let me share my screen again. All right. Now we're going to introduce you, formally introduce you to Bob since he's already been active um, in the chat today. Um, Bob Mitchie is a um, living legend in the MSP world. <laughs> he's the president and cybersecurity strategist at Metro MSP uh, in New Jersey. I think she just called you old, Bob. I think that's yeah. That I was think the you were too. There. It was she was well, slightly saying I was old. I've got a year in here, so I mean, you, people can figure you know figure it out. <laughs> I've got some fun facts about Bob though before we get started. He has a beagle named Sadie. It was very cute. I have pictures on my phone. Not here today. Not here today. Um, he has one of the first documented successful phishing campaigns that was launched in 1984. So that gives you a little context into his age <laughs> and yep. his most engaging videos on YouTube are his walk in the woods. So welcome, Bob. I have to start. I was going to ask a question about, I wanted to see Sadie, but I know she's not there today. Yeah, Sadie's so not here today. Move on to the next question. Um, tell me about this, this uh, phishing campaign when I, this is actually on Wikipedia. I looked it up and it, it says you were a sandy haired whiz kid at the time. So <laughs> Please. That was a little more hair. That was a little more hair ago. Uh, so this would be back in the eight, 1983, 84 timeframe. Um, this, what we're talking about right now, I think is probably, is one of the first documented cases of a successful phishing email. Uh, there, there was a magazine article that I was mentioned in, in Omni magazine, which is no longer in print, but 
you can find it online. And I pulled it out a couple of weeks ago and I was reading through and thought about it and realized that what I did there really was a sanctioned um, attack. I, I was given a challenge to uh, break into a system. And the way I did it was I sent an email and the email and that system, it, was, it, it wasn't an internet-based email. It was a closed email system, kind of like the early days of AOL. This system was the predecessor for a research project that ultimately uh, things like AOL and CompuServe spun off of it. But I sent an email. The guy clicked on the email, opened up the email. As soon as he opened up and read it, it, it granted me full permissions to the platform. I had access to absolutely everything. So it was a benign attack. And if you look on Wikipedia, the, the first real real attack that I've seen out there was, when, I think, in 1994, uh, which had, was AOL-based, and it was sending people to a, a payment site. But you know, th this was, uh, I think, my claim to fame. I can't say I'm yeah. number one. I yours don't know. Is, it's first in the timeline of phishing in Wikipedia. Yours is first. So. That's pretty cool. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> and the uh, the walk in the woods. You know, I started doing live videos when COVID was COVID. Um, was going on and we were talk just walking in the woods talking about some of the cyber attacks that we've seen or things that we've been reading about and engagement on Facebook has been pretty incredible of uh, just people liking sharing it and putting it out there because you know it's not like it's a formal presentation it's me walking through the woods with Sadie and and we'll talk about some of the attacks I talked about um, I know one of the ones I did was a business email compromise where you know the the small financial services firm was compromised and if we had SAS alerts we would have known it but it wasn't one of our clients and um, we ultimately helped them get money back because of the forensic work that that we did so no, so it's like do do things that are unusual to um to stand out from the from the pack awesome Pat, you had a couple questions for Bob as well. Yeah, yeah, I think we all do. So my question, really, Bob, I wanted to hone in on paid assessments versus free assessments. We go back and forth all the time. It's like I talk to some MSPs are adamant that you got to keep it free, and here's why. And then others say, absolutely not. You must charge for it. So, Bob, free, paid, what say you? Hard question, because depending on who you talk to, there is definitely uh, reasons to do both. Uh, I've I've done paid. I actually like, you know, a, a real cybersecurity assessment. If we're going to go through the work, we deserve to get paid. There's a fair amount of work that needs to happen to do it correctly. If we're just going to do a quick um, click on something and do, do a report on it, I may not charge, might not charge for that. But, you know, when someone's been compromised, we really want to know what's in that environment. Make it a paid assessment. People think they're getting value out of it and that people, people will get more value out of it and show up. And, um, and then um, really help you along because, you know, we're seeing people this, that, you know, go, we're, it's a free assessment, so we're just going to do it. And no one shows up to the meeting. Mm -hmm. And so, if, you know, put, let them make sure they've got skin in the game because you're going to put skin in the game. You know, uh, you know we, we run SAS alerts for, for at least three weeks on, on, a, uh, on a risk assessment right now because we, we want to gather a bunch of data into the platform for that. And uh, you just showed everybody how to hack the billing system so that we're not getting billed for it. So mm. now that's great. And let me ask, um, and you don't have to get exact here, but give us ballpark. Like, how do you even charge for those? Do you do it per head? Is it one flat fee depend no matter who the customer or prospect is? How do you get to the number that you're going to charge? We charge $1,500 minimum assessment fee for up to 10 users. And then and then we'll throw in a hundred or hundred and fifteen bucks a p every additional user uh, to go over to go over over and above that. It's 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 number it gets them out there. It, it's not going to break the bank. And it also it also helps assess the water because our our minimum client that I want to see is going to be over a thousand dollars a month. So if, so so if they're going to complain about a fifteen hundred dollar assessment or they can't can't pull the trigger on it, well we got some red flags already. Mm. Mm. That's great insight. Thank you for that. Um, Daniel, I think you had a question too. Yeah, I mean, I guess the question I have for Bob is, you know, we talked a lot about, um, you know, going in and, and have you dealt with any of those co-managed environments yet that you have to go into and, and speak with? I know we talked a little bit about it before. We do a little bit of work with co-managed. Um, most of the co-managed stuff we have we uh, has all been um, more, more turning into more break fix relationships. They um, we we've, we've got we've got some we've got one big client that we're working on bringing on right now, but nothing not, nothing in the long term. 
but it, you know, this definitely is the plot, you know, one of the platforms that that's in, in our stack that's going to be there because it's got the visibility. Excellent. Jim MacGyver. Yeah. I'd like to know um, we're all here for the same reason for learning how to leverage SaaS solutions for prospecting for you and your successful history working with us as a partner, what's your go-to SaaS alerts uh, report and why do you choose that one? Okay. So it's not just one report, you know, in, in our, in our cybersecurity risk assessment, the part of the presentation, we pop up the, we pop up the world map, show them that they're really under attack. Mm -hmm. And, and then if they, you know, and then if they've already, you know, we've already gone through an assessment process, uh, an interview process where they say, oh yeah, we have MFA turned on. Everybody does it. We pop up that report and show them, oh, yeah, you kind of do, but not everybody. And oh, by the way, uh, have you heard about the traveler's insurance case where they denied an insurance claim because not everybody had had MFA? And then the other the other nail in that coffin is going to be the um, the public the uh, the file share report because yeah you know you're in the cloud that's great but do you know your people are actually sharing data that lasts forever out there? And then we go through some of the links that are in there and they're like, uh, no, we had no idea. Mm. And so it's really, it's really, you know, it's really doing a deeper dive into uh, that data that's out there and just SAS alerts makes it easier to find it. Now, Bob, let me ask, and you know, we talked a lot about leads and getting leads, I, you know, I, I'm curious to find out from the audience and I would love your answer too, but, you know, in the past 60 days, how many leads, how many new customers have you added into your CRM? So I'd love Please. it if people could um, put that number in, even if it's just a, you know, a, a guesstimate, but in the past two months, how many new leads have you put into your CRM? Bob, I would love to hear about your journey there. And then secondly, talk about maybe some of the verticals that you've chosen to service or not service. Sure. So customer, you know, customers and leads, you know, I saw somebody just posted something about customers. We're talking pure raw leads or pro leads or prospects right now. Um, uh, just to throw it out there, Pat, I actually ran the numbers ahead of before here. We ran, we put 256, 256 new prospects in the in the CRM in the last 60 mm. days by working with partners. Mm. And um, we and that's coming off of three webinars. How so, much did it cost you? Uh, it cost me nothing because I've already paid. I'm, you know, my my CRMs a sunk cost. Web uh, zooms are zooms a sunk cost and. Um, it really was promote working on promotions with client with clients. He's, we didn't buy any lists for this. I worked with people that had lists. So a, J, a joint venture, a JV webinar with one of our clients who happens to create help nonprofits do uh, set up boards. He had a list of eight thousand people, and he promoted a nonprofit. We, we created a webinar specifically to the nonprofit niche. It spoke to mm. the messaging spoke to them. It wasn't this global cybersecurity message. You know, in this case, people like niched people like to like to think they're that something's about them. Was the webinar really any different for nonprofit versus um, the CPA and accountant webinar? Not really, but we talked about it, and that webinar that webinar got us um, seventy four people on the webinar uh, last week, and five people converted to appointments already. So uh, we're still we're still doing follow ups from there. And oh, by the way, these are. The, and since, since you know, since, since if the bad guys can be anywhere, so can we now on the cyber side. The yesterday's appointment was a 200 person nonprofit in Roswell, New Mexico. Where hey, Bob, that's awesome. That's great information, and thank you. That's a lot of bunch, a bunch of ways to, to look at finding people to talk to that I don't think uh, we, everyone else always thinks of. Uh, some of it was new to me. We do have a question, and it sounds like Kurt's looking for a little bit more info from this about the the very beginning of the funnel. Um, he said, I'm totally missing how this helps with prospecting. I see how this might help with a presentation, but prospecting is finding the people to talk to. And I don't entirely disagree. Um, I do think that that might be so, simplifying the concept because there's more to prospecting than just getting in front of the person. You got to have value to present in the process. Um, but I'd love your take from it, if you would care sure. to address that. So, you know, prospecting, you know, I, I mentioned just a minute ago, using other people's lists. Um, if somebody has a list that has a relationship with with that per with with, an, with with a group of people or or can or, or yeah basically if they if they have a relationship with a group of people and they can help you promote a webinar. So in this case, I had Dennis Miller um, who helped help create um, the nonprofits, 
he was going to hop on the call, but something happened at the last minute, but he promoted it. We used his brand to get it out. It went through it, went out through his CRM. And prior to that, we, um, we did, we, we actually did a webinar a month ago for CPAs and accountants found, I found somebody who was an author in that space. He actually runs a coaching program. A lot of, you know, him and we used his list to promote it. When, when I when I talked about FTC with him, he was like, oh, wow, we really should promote this to our people. They ran two webinars with us and we got 182 names, new people on our list that are all CPAs and bookkeepers coast to coast. Nice. Mm. Okay. But the best part was have a message. You know, Patrick, Pat talked about having having a message that you can actually close close something. You are closing a sale on a webinar. It might be for an appointment. It might be. You know, it might be for a download, but it, it is one step. That hun- sure. that 182 person registration list turned into a 74 person webinar, and we booked 21 appointments in that one call. It was an incredible feeling going through the cl- the, uh, the our, our pitch at the end, which was just scheduling a strategy call, and having my email blow up with. Um, yeah. That's a, yeah, that's a hell of a conversion rate, Bob. I know we got one minute left and I want to, Kurt, give you one other takeaway. Um, there's another aspect to the SaaS alerts thing for the prospecting piece I don't want you guys to miss. Um, I, I'm not real keen on clicking on emails myself unless there's something in there that actually like gets my interest and was, makes me willing to receive you know, the next 50 emails you're going to get from a salesperson. Uh, and I'd argue that SaaS alerts offers one of those things. Go into this saying like, hey, uh, how do you feel about the security of your M365 environments? Have you suffered a business email compromise? Is your current IT provider taking care of that? For literally nothing, I can assess the situation for you. At least give the opening to someone to show them there's a value you can add that they're most likely not getting from their partner now. Uh, You'll be surprised how often you'll get a response to that because there is a need. And most businesses out there, 84% have suffered a business email compromise. Be the first MSP to approach that and say, hey, I have a resolution to it. You'll get more clicks through your emails. Michelle, put the QR code up. I don't want to lose people. Just they were kind of okay. So sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, you guys can keep the conversation going. Um, I just posted the QR code that is going to take you to the sales toolkit that has those four pieces that we talked about. It has the the presentation deck, it has the playbook, it has the pricing calculator and the SAS report. So go there, you can download them individually. Um, check it out. Um, and if you have any questions, you can reach out to sales at sasalerts.com. Immediately following this webinar, we are going to stop recording. Some of us are going to hang back. Um, Jim is going to give a live demo and you can dig in a little deeper if you'd like. So Excellent. Thank well, yeah, thank you everyone for coming. I know we're that's it on time. We're 201. Appreciate it. Uh, we'll be doing this again here, um, you know, hopefully over the next quarter. And again, stick around if you want a live demo and, and to talk more about the product. Thanks. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone.